Delighted uh, today to be joined by Luke Harding of The Guardian, who has just written this excellent book, The Snowden Files, available from all good bookshops. Um, Luke was formerly uh, Moscow bureau chief of uh, The Guardian uh, and has written extensively on subjects uh, including the WikiLeaks disclosures as well as the recent Snowden disclosures. But the topic of today's conversation is his latest book, uh, on Edward Snowden. So from the top, what do you think motivated Edward Snowden in making these disclosures? I, I think uh, an old fashioned, uh, uh, incidentally, very nice to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see you. Um, I, I think an old fashioned sense of patriotism, if you like. Um, uh, Snowden's from a kind of American tradition, from a very patriotic military family. He was someone who at least initially uh, believed in the system, um, uh, even volunteered to fight in Iraq um, to try, try to join the kind of army. Um, and, and essentially, I think what uh, became clear to him in his intelligence career, initially with the CIA <clears throat> working in Switzerland and then subsequently as a contractor for the NSA both in Japan and Hawaii, was that he felt the American government was uh, behaving unconstitutionally and illegally, that these programs of mass surveillance that a year ago we knew nothing about, and now, of course, we, we know quite a lot about, uh, that they sort of violated the fu sort of fundamental principles, the founding principles of America. And so, for me, I think, I mean, I, I portray him quite sympathetically in my book. Um, I think he's an idealist. He, he's a patriot. Um, and actually, he, he spoke yesterday to the Council of Europe in, in one, of, one of his kind of um, uh, Skyped-in video links from Moscow, and he said, look, um, I didn't want to bring down the US government or blow it up. Uh, I wanted to reform it. He sees himself as a reformer. And there's an, interesting, there's an interesting contrast which you make, and it kind of runs throughout your book, mm -hmm. between the character of Snowden and the character of Assange. And so Snowden is this sort of libertarian uh, who keeps a copy of the US Constitution on his desk at work and really views himself as a patriot, whereas Assange is a very different character indeed. And I get the impression... You can say that again. Yeah. <laughs> I get the impression from your book that, I th you know, you, you mentioned, you obviously go into detail about what, you know, Putin's Russia, the state of human rights violations. And, of course, this is where Snowden ends up, possibly... Uh, arranged by WikiLeaks, but you slightly pull your punches on uh, Assange's role in him ending up there. What do you think happened? Why does he end up in Putin's Russia? And it, you know, do you have a sense that were there any other alternatives available for him? Yeah, uh, uh, there are a lot of kind of complex and uh, interesting uh, answers to your questions. There's several questions rolled into one. Yeah. I mean, I would say. Uh, you, you know, the, is Edward Snowden uh, a Russian spy or working for some other foreign intelligence service? The answer emphatically is no, he's not. E even though various senior figures in the United States, Mike Rogers, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, and others have hinted that this was a kind of nefarious plot from Moscow stretching back some years. Um, I've come across no evidence while I was writing my book uh, that this is true, and Snowden himself has vigorously said, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a spy, or at least he's not a, he, he was an American spy, of course, but not a spy for anybody else. Um, and you, you look at what happened. He was in Hawaii. He swiped the NSA service. He fled to Hong Kong. Uh, and there he had this kind of extraordinary encounter with um, my colleagues, uh, Glenn Greenwald at the time, who um, was working for Guardian US, Ewan McCaskill, uh, the Guardian's former Washington correspondent, and the US filmmaker, Laura Poitras. Um, and uh, he basically turned this material over to them and said, look, publish stories, exercise your editorial judgment uh, on the theme of mass surveillance, but don't damage legitimate, what he regarded as legitimate US intelligence operations. Now, th this isn't really the behavior of a spy. I mean, as Snowden said himself in a kind of interview last summer when he was in hiding in Hong Kong. He came up with this lovely phrase, which was, if I were a Chinese spy, I'd be sitting in Beijing petting a phoenix by now. <laughs> uh, he's not petting a phoenix. He's stuck in Moscow uh, 
rather Phoenix free. Uh, and how did he get there? Well, um, that's another very interesting question. S we don't entirely know. What, what we know is that um, after meeting Greenwald McCaskill Poitras, he disappeared for two weeks. Um, and his options were rapidly shrinking because he'd outed himself in this extraordinary video interview, which I'm sure you've all seen uh, last June, which The Guardian ran, said, look, I I'm the guy behind these, these national security leaks. Uh, and then, of course, the US was very keen to, to grab him. Um, and at this point, Julian Assange dispatched Sarah Harrison, who's a WikiLeaks journalist, to Hong Kong, uh, and they um, decided they would, they would flee. The, the, the goal originally was to go to Latin America, to, to Ecuador or to Venezuela, um, basically to a sort of leftist, democratic South American state. Um, and they couldn't route via the US for obvious reasons, and yeah. so they ended up going via Moscow. Now, um, Snowden is stuck in Moscow. The US revoked his passport. Um, it's which you write, you, which you think is a massive blunder on well, their part. Well, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's not his fault that he's in Moscow. But having said that, um, clearly Russia, a country I know well, is is a problem for Snowden. It's it's a problem for what I write in my book, Mike. I, I call it his sort of uh, his story, his narrative of principal exile. Um, is tricky because Russia, under Putin, as we know, is a kind of gloomy. Uh, authoritarian, um, veering towards totalitarian uh, state, run by a, a paranoid uh, and conspiratorial anti-Western KGB leadership. Yep. Um, and um, so this is, this is tricky for Snowden, but I, I, I don't think it invalidates what he's done in revealing mass surveillance. I don't think it invalidates his status as a whistleblower. And I mean, the book ends on quite a gloomy note when we look at, you know, when we look at the, Snowden himself, he's now, he's got a one year, you know, one year asylum in Russia. It's not a great place to be if you're a human rights activist. Uh, you know, what do you think happens to Snowden himself? Well, I mean, it's another good question. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, Snowden is, is stuck in Russia. Um, his original goal actually was to go to Iceland. Good media laws. Yep. Nice volcanoes, <laughs> climate not so good, but but you know a lot freer, more democratic place than Russia. But uh, Iceland didn't work, and and one of the ironies of this story is, even though a lot of European uh, Union countries, notably Germany, um, but others as well, have have been aghast at the, the the volume and sheer intrusiveness of U.S. spying, bugging Angela Merkel's cell phone, and so on. Actually, none of them have had the bravery to offer. Edward no. Snowden Asylum, because the, the bill in terms of transatlantic relations is simply too high. Um, and I think the reality is that, that Snowden won't be leaving the Russian Federation anytime soon. I, I, I suspect strongly that uh, Vladimir Putin will extend his asylum for another year when it expires this summer. And I think what, what Snowden is trying to do, what his lawyers at the um, ACLU um, in New York are trying to do, and, and I think to a degree what, what newspapers have reported this stuff, like The Guardian and The New York Times are trying to do, is to kind of create a political climate in the United States where some kind of deal may become possible. At the moment, the mood is vengeful from the White House, from the NSA, from uh, the intelligence agencies. They are furious with him. But it's clear that what he revealed was in the public interest yep. um, and that Obama himself has announced reforms to the way the NSA operates. And so one would hope in time, he may be able to come back home without spending decades and decades in jail like Chelsea Manning. And this is a very interesting pro process book about whistleblowing itself. And there's a really nice scene where uh, Ewan McCaskill comes in and he's, he goes over to Snowden and he wants to record his, um, his conversation with him. And so he takes out his iPhone and he starts recording. And of course, Snowden is just aghast at the idea that he's brought this piece of technology that can be used to track him into this hotel room. I mean, mm. we're talking about the leak now, not of small dossiers of files handed over by a civil servant, but gigabytes of data. How, how part of your book is about how The Guardian responds to this. Do you think that mm. even large newspapers, you know, such as The Guardian, are able to cope now with the volume of these leaks? And does it, does it pose technical challenges? Yeah, it does. I mean, this story posed enormous challenges. I mean, The Guardian's been going since, I think, 1824, and I think this was the most complicated 
most difficult, most fraught story that we've ever dealt with. It was, it was difficult legally because we had, we had David Cameron uh, privately bullying us and pressuring us to destroy this material. Yeah. Uh, it was difficult editorially because we had reporters working on this project flung all over the world, Glenn Greenwald in Brazil, my colleagues in Washington, uh, you know, Ewan McCaskill, Glenn Laura in Hong Kong, um, uh, GCHQ in Cheltenham. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that was very hard. Um, uh, and and it, was, it was problematic technically because obviously this is highly sensitive material. And we, we were mindful from the very beginning that we would do precisely what Snowden had asked us to do. In other words, publish stories in the public interest about... Uh, about mass surveillance of civilians, not of terrorists. What we were not going to do was to um, reveal stuff about ongoing operations in Afghanistan, uh, I Iran, names of agents, anything like that. Um, we didn't, and we haven't, despite some conservative MPs accusing us of behaving perfidiously. We've been very responsible. So what we did was we set up a bunker, a secret bunker, on the fourth floor of The Guardian. Um, it was a bit like something out of the Bourne films, I have to say. <laughs> um, and... I was part of a small team that examined some of Snowden's files in this bunker. We had security guards outside the front door um, 24 hours a day. So, so basically, you know, apart from a very restricted list of senior people, no one could get inside. We had four laptops, or uh, um, well, three laptops and a PC, um, which were brand new, had never been connected to the internet or any other network. We worked entirely offline. Uh, and we worked to this objective, to, to write stories about mass... Uh, surveillance and, and I think we did pretty well, but the problem was, of course, we had the um, we had the British government uh, beating us with a big legal stick. And there's a real again another one of the themes comes through this book is is that this surveillance is a U.S. U.K. partnership. Yeah. Uh, the GCHQ Snowden says GCHQ is worse than the the NSO um, in in the book, and but there's a real difference between the way the US deals with this, which is to, at the beginning to start to bully and intimidate, but, it, but towards the end, the Guardian is publishing from New York because yeah. you have the First Amendment and you have that enshrined belief in freedom of expression. On the other hand, the UK government comes out of this book very badly indeed. And I mean, do you want to just explain some of the bullying that went on? And yeah, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think this was a, for anyone who cares about press, press freedom, for anyone who cares about freedom of expression, uh, I think what happened to The Guardian last summer was, it was a chilling moment and, and really a kind of reminder that even mature democratic states can have moments of, 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 of madness and, and um, behave in a, in a profoundly undemocratic way. Uh, what, what happened was that uh, initially, um, the, the spy agencies, Downing Street, the National Security Council, they were um, dumbfounded. They didn't know who Edward Snowden was. They didn't know what he'd taken. They, they were struggling to explain how a 29-year-old contractor sitting in Hawaii could, could download more than 50,000 GCHQ files without GCHQ noticing. Yeah. Um, and they were in a mood of kind of panic and, and, and shock. Uh, I, I talked to one senior Whitehall official who said, um, we just sat up and said, oh my God. You know, so they had about several weeks of oh my God. Uh, and, and then when they kind of collected themselves, um, they decided that they would try and get the stuff back from The Guardian uh, and stop us from publishing. Um, and so um, Cameron sent Sir Jeremy Hayward, who's his cabinet secretary, probably the most powerful man you've never heard of, uh, to go to uh, Alan Rusbridger and Paul Johnson, the editor. Um, he, he, he did two visits and basically say, destroy this material or we will shut you down. There are people in government who want you shut down. Um, uh, you know, hand these files back. And, and Alan Rusbridger, of course, explained that this was pointless, that we live in a modern digital age, that this material leaked by Snowden existed in many different jurisdictions, including in Brazil and the United States. Yep. We, we, we explained that we were partnering with the New York Times and ProPublica. And so handing the stuff back wouldn't stop what they regarded as a sort of damaging flow of stories. But, you know, the government was not in listening mode. And, and, and I have the impression um, that, you know, David Cameron just sort of extended a languid Etonian arm and said, sort of, deal with it. Without, as usual, sort of thinking very deeply about what dealing with it was. And so we ended up in this situation where 
we, we did indeed, as you say, we offshored our reporting operation to the New York Times, so we carried on publishing, and we're still publishing. Uh, and <clears throat> at, at the government's insistence, two spies from GCHQ, uh, who'd been lurking outside our offices in King's Cross in a white van for some time, or, or nearby, came in, um, and um, last summer, uh, and in, in the kind of the underground car park of the basement, three of my colleagues smashed up our hard drives while, while these sort of spies took photos on their iPhone and kind of padded around. And, and they knew that the information was, was already in the States. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I, totally I, I, I describe it in my book yeah. as half pantomime and half Stasi. <laughs> and I think that there was something comedic about it. But as I say, for people who care about press freedom, I, I, I think it was, it was a deeply troubling moment. And, and it's actually quite hard work. I don't know if you've ever tried to smash up a, a laptop. No, but, I haven't actually. But you, you, need, you need a kind of drill, you need goggles. There's a lot of, if you see the video on the, the Guardian website, there's a lot of kind of <laughs> like this. <laughs> and, and it was sort of farcical. And after three hours, these things have been sort of smashed up. And the spooks from GCHQ, um, whom we uh, nicknamed the Hobbits, we called them the Hobbits, <laughs> they brought along a little box called a degausser, which is like a, it looks like a microwave that you, you heat your kind of curry yeah. in. Um, but in fact, it demagnetizes uh, hard drives. And so, so um, we had to sort of post the bits of laptop into the degausser, like little kids posting plastic shapes into a box. Um, and um, then sort of waited for several minutes while one of the spies sort of bent over and watched attentively. And after about three or four minutes, there was a pop. And Russ Bridger keeps a piece of one of the, he, a, bit, he, a bit of motherboard in his pocket he, he, as a kind of talisman. He, he does. I mean, I write about it. I compare it in my book to a kind of, a, a piece of kind of saint's bone carried around by a medieval pilgrim. But I, <laughs> but, I mean, I think it kind of, it's a reminder for him and for us of um, how governments can go wrong. Uh, and I think, actually, uh, of the quite kind of oligarchic um, impulses of people at the top of the British state. And... <sighs> Critics would say that uh, the Deputy Prime Minister expressed concern, say, you know, the leader of the Liberal De Democrat Party, leader of the Labour Party expressed concern. Basically, politicians from across the political spectrum said to the Guardian, not all of them, but most of them said to the Guardian, we think as, as, as you know, your democratically elected representatives that you are acting in a way that could damage national security. As a journalist, how do you balance that, being against the entirety of the political establishment with something that you believe is in the public interest. Yeah. But, but of course, you as the Guardian are making that call. Sure, I mean, I mean it's a good question. Uh, it's an important question. Uh, and uh, 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 what you have to bear in mind, though, is that actually Downing Street last summer, they did not know what we, what we had. They didn't know what Edward Snowden had leaked. But nevertheless, despite their basic ignorance, I mean, at one point, Jeremy Hayward said, or I think it was Craig Oliver, Cameron's press spokesman, uh, we think you've got 20 or 30 documents in fact, we had more than 55,000. Uh, yeah. So they didn't know anything, but they took this absolutist view that th this was a kind of existential threat to national security, um, and we shouldn't be reporting or interrogating this material. Um, and we, we said explicitly and very early on that we would not... Uh, uh, we would not damage operations, that we would consult with them, that we would uh, engage with them, which indeed we did, both in London and in New York and elsewhere, and that we would talk to them um, uh, before publication, and that if they had specific national security concerns, they could raise them. And in, in some cases, we did take out one or two details uh, after they said it. But um, I, I think we did, we, we did what any responsible newspaper would do, which is to have a kind of strict editorial process and to publish in the public interest. It was a very high bar. There's a, a lot of stuff we haven't published. The majority of files we've published nothing from. <clears throat> and of course, it gets worse because David Miranda is detained later at Heathrow Airport under the Terrorism Act. You were there when the judges were making that decision. It's been criticized by uh, civil liberties and human rights groups such as English Pen. What, what, what's your take on this on this judgment? Yeah, well, well for, just for those who, who are not aware of the David Miranda story, <clears throat> just to briefly recap, he was carrying highly encrypted <clears throat> Snowden material, uh, working as Glenn Greenwald's journalist assistant, uh, returning from <clears throat> visiting Laura Poitras in Berlin via Heathrow Airport to see Glenn in Rio when he was uh, stopped. Basically, MI5 um, 
had been tracking his movements, had obviously been bugging his, his, his phone and surveilling him, and had decided that they were going to try and grab whatever he had. So this, we, we've had some of these documents under Freedom of Information, so we know the kind of planning that was going on. Um, and essentially, the, the problem was that, that they still didn't know what we had, and they were desperate to find out. Um, and um, what they could have done with David Miranda is they could have gone to a judge and said, look, we're um, concerned about the situation, uh, you know, got a warrant, arrested him, used proper due process. But they didn't. Instead, what they did was they used um, the Anti-Terrorism Act, Section 7, and basically stopped him for nine hours, interrogated him as a terrorist. I mean, this legislation... Yep. Um, was drafted to deal with jihadists who wanted to kind of blow up planes. And in fact, they were applying it for the first time ever in British history to someone engaged in the journalistic project. Um, and it, again, I think it was pretty kind of chilling s stuff. And even, even um, Charles Clark, who drafted the Terrorism Act, said that this, this was not why he'd written it. This was a misapplication. So we, we appealed this. We took this to judicial review in the High Court. Um, and I cover that case, as you say, and I kind of knew from the very beginning that we were doomed because basically we were arguing from press principles and we were facing three elderly judges in their mid to late 60s um, for whom the internet was something they occasionally perused but not <laughs> something which had penetrated deep into their lives with sort of cufflinks and wigs and so on. And, and at one point one of them said, I don't think this Snowden fellow is terribly good. He's given all our secrets to the Russians. Uh, and I knew we'd had it. And, of course, the judges found in favor of the security agencies and against David Miranda, against the Guardian, and so on. And just finally, before we, we, we have some questions from the audience, I mean, this is, this is the big question, which is we've had these disclosures. They show that GCHQ and the NSA are hoovering up an enormous amount of private data, not well, just pretty, pretty much all of it, pretty much all of it yeah, yeah. From, from everyone on earth. Yeah, but I, including you. Yeah. Mr. So yeah. For, for someone that is uh, the ordinary internet user, someone in the audience today, yeah, what does this mean for them? Because it's very technical, and you try and make this accessible. Well, <laughs> why should we be so concerned about our privacy and our rights, freedom of expression, because of these disclosures? Well, I, I just think we're at a kind of tipping point in in, in human history where where privacy, which is something we've taken for granted for, for thousands of years is, is being eroded to the point where we may never get it back. Because what, what's happened without any great public debate in secret, without acknowledgement, is that over the last sort of six or seven years, I would say from about 2008, 2009, the spies, both British spies and American spies, but with the British spies at the vanguard, have, have developed these extraordinary buffering systems, which means essentially they can capture and store pretty much all of the, the world's internet traffic. Previously, the volumes were so great that they couldn't do it, but now they can. Um, and we know from the documents that Snowden leaked that, that, that Bude, this listening station in, in GCHQ, plays a big role in this. Um, and uh, essentially what they do is they collect all of our, of our metadata, which is probably the, the word of 2013. So um, that means... Uh, uh, email addresses, it means, you know, subject headers, it, 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 it means our telephony records, Location. it means what we browse. Um, and, um, you know, the spies say, well, this isn't content. But the reality is, from this material, you can construct a kind of rich electronic story, a rich electronic narrative of someone's life, that their loves, their secrets, their, their sexual affiliation, their political affiliation, and so on. It's incredibly detailed. Um, and this has been collected on everybody all of the time. Now, that doesn't mean that, that spies are spying at what, uh, you know, on every single thing that you're doing. But, but I, I just think it's a kind of fundamental breach of the, of the, the social contract between the citizen and the state. I mean, we, we, in this country, we have an assumption that, you know, we are innocent until proven guilty. Whereas this whole grandiose spying mechanism turns that on its head and basically says that everybody is potentially a target of suspicion. Um, uh, and the most depressing aspect of this system, the, the one that Snowden kept talking about, was that this stuff is stored and can be sifted retrospectively. So, so your web browsing history from two years ago, some spy should, c can search it. And what Snowden said yesterday to the Council of Europe was that 
um, there's a sort of de facto policy of guilt by association. So they may be tracking a legitimate target, but plenty of other people who are, who are not, um, have got nothing to do with this or have clicked on the wrong link, visited the wrong website, they're sucked in to this system. And y you don't have to be a genius to work out how this system could be abused, both by democratic states, authoritarian states, private businesses, and so on. And I, I just think we need to pause and we need to have a kind of sensible democratic conversation about whether this is appropriate, whether it's legal, and whether we, we, we want to, to live in a world which has the potential to kind of, you know, have a deadening effect on the human soul and on human creativity. That's right. Speaking of conversations, do we have any, I'll, I'll take three questions from the audience. Do you have a mic? Yeah. This lady there. This yeah, lady here right. first. Um, I'm an editor at Norwegian newspaper uh, Morgenblad, so I obviously um, sympathize with what you say about the free press. Uh, and I was interested in what you said about um, you ex experienced more freedom in the, in the United States. Uh, Edward Snowden, obviously, he made the judgment that uh, for what he had done, he would not be given a fair trial or that it would be too dangerous for him to stay there. Do you think that uh, that will necessarily always be the case? Or do you think there's a um, possibility for a diplomatic solution and that he might return to the States? And if he does, do you think it's possible for him to get a fair trial? Uh, well, I, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, what, what's been interesting about the United States is that really from the first night of revelations, there's been a kind of heated, vibrant, democratic conversation there about, about what Snowden's done, whether he's a hero, whether he's a traitor, um, how he should be treated, whether this was betrayal or actually something which was in the public interest. Uh, um, what's been fascinating w watching this is that the normal political calculus in, in America has been scrambled. I mean, I think Snowden has done more for bipartisanship than anybody for decades because um, you have... Um, people on the libertarian right who are pro-Snowden, the Tea Party, and you have young people who are pro-Snowden. And this never happens. You never get young people in the Tea Party agreeing on anything. I mean, it's... it's and, and some Democrats. Uh, yeah, and some Democrats as well, and people who care about civil liberties. And w the, the paradigm there is almost kind of Washington insiders who hate Snowden and are against Snowden versus kind of outsiders. Um, and this is, a, this is a fascinating kind of dynamic. Um, but... I was in the U.S. A, a, a month ago. I mean, my sense, though, is I, I saw General Alexander, the, the outgoing head of the NSA, speaking, is, is that the security agencies are in no mood for clemency. Um, the White House, um, uh, the Obama administration, more generally, has taken a, a really tough attitude towards whistleblowing and people who leak classified information. It's prosecuted more people than, any, than all previous administrations put together. Um, and so... I, I think for the moment, Snowden is stuck. I mean, could he get a fair trial? Well, I mean, he broke the law. I mean, there's no doubt about that. He did break the law. But what you have to ask yourself is, um, is there a public interest defense? In my view, there is, overwhelmingly, emphatically. He started an important, epochal, global conversation. But does that mean he'll avoid jail if he goes back to the US tomorrow? No, it doesn't. Do you have any other qu question here? Any other questions at this point? Yeah, we'll just say this one. Hi there. How long were you given to write the book? And did you have any contact with Snowden before, during, or after? And has he, is he aware of the book? And did he agree with its contents? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good question as well. Um, I took about five, six months to write the book. I think they got me to do it because I'm, I'm quick, you know. Plus, Hollywood bought my last book, so, <laughs> so that was a book on WikiLeaks, uh, which was made into a bad Hollywood film uh, called <laughs> The Fifth Estate, which came out last year. Um, um, in terms of contact with Snowden, I um, personally <clears throat> didn't meet him in Moscow. My, my backstory is that I was the bureau chief, as Mike said, for four years, and I was expelled from uh, Russia in 2011, and I'm, I'm persona non grata. I can't go back to the Russian Federation, so I, you know, I would have loved to have sat down with him in a Moscow cafe over a cup of tea, but that was never going to happen. But obviously, the Guardian has been had broke the story and has been doing it from the very beginning. And um, my colleague Ewan McCaskill, who collaborated on this book, spent six days with Snowden in Hong Kong, spent many hours talking to him about his his motives, about his ideals, about his his uh, career. Um, and so, in a way, kind of, it's sort of it's Ewan's 
portrait of Snowden, I think, which, which, which became my portrait. Um, and plus, of course, I interviewed all the protagonists. I saw Glenn Greenwald in Brazil, um, Laura Poitras in Berlin, and so on, and, and numerous other people. Um, what does Snowden think about it? I, I, I asked his lawyer this when I saw him in New York last month, uh, and basically he said, Snowden hasn't complained about it. Uh, <laughs> in, in other words, if he didn't like it, I mean, the book is overwhelmingly sympathetic to Snowden, but also kind of realistic about the state of human rights in Russia. Um, uh, I think if he didn't like it, he would have denounced it, but he hasn't. Um, and um, we, we, the Guardian, are still on very good terms with Snowden and uh, continue to report. I mean, I wrote a story yesterday about his Council of Europe speech. So I, I think relations are, are very friendly. And just finally on that, we, we in the New York Times a couple of months ago did, I think, a very important editorial calling on the US government to offer Snowden clemency. Uh, and I, I think that was a kind of, that was a good moment. And there are moves to try and uh, give him asylum in Germany as well. That that's, seems to be the other, yeah. got a question from the back. Luke, can you um, talk about the self-censorship you practiced when doing this story and journalist responsibility uh, when I, I, I've never it. practiced self-censorship. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah. I don't understand. Uh, uh, you know, what did you leave out? And uh, for this select private audience, can you perhaps reveal any nuggets still to come? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want me to kind of blow up national security yeah. and undermine 10 months of responsible reporting? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, well, I mean, some of the stuff we left out, which I think was quite jolly and, and went in danger of national security, was just about the culture of GCHQ. There are quite a lot of documents which are just stuff from the bureaucratic machine about their carpool, about their sporting tournaments. Uh, it, it gives a lovely window into this rather nerdish, very geeky world of spying where, where people lead an interesting life in Cheltenham, but also quite a provincial life to the point where going up to London is, is a big adventure. Um, uh, w one document we came across was... Um, the rules for the civil service five-a-side football tournaments, which stretched <laughs> to about 12 pages uh, and talked about women as lady players. Uh, and I think, you know, I sometimes got the impression that GCHQ, despite its fantastic technology, its supercomputers, its brilliant mathematicians, is somehow stuck in the world of the 50s and 60s. Um, so that was all kind of quite entertaining, but but probably slightly off topic with our broader theme of, of mass surveillance. Um, uh, they have a puzzle sheet called Kryptos, which sets very difficult challenges. Bear in mind that everybody is super good at maths there. Um, and ciphers, they have historical ciphers. You know, ciphers found on the body of dead Swedish generals from the 18th century, which no one has been able to crack, which has sort of circulated around. So it's a genteel world. I, I'm going to slightly stretch the time um, and, and ask one final question, which is, so you talked about the US, big heated debate. Obama has made a number of speeches on this. Uh, you had uh, a bill in Congress that got very, very narrowly defeated. In the UK, silence. The main political parties have said next to nothing about it or spouted platitudes about having a longer conversation. Why is it that there have been the most extraordinary rev revelations on mass state surveillance and in the UK, our political class has just remained silent? I, it's a great question. It's one I kind of grapple with in the book w without coming to any kind of definite conclusions. But what, what, what had the impression when we were publishing this stuff that, that kind of Britain collectively was like someone who had a very long and enjoyable lunch and was kind of having a sort of <laughs> postprandial doze, occasionally waking up, uh, then going back to sleep again, you know, and then waiting for a nurse to bring around a cup of tea and a biscuit. Uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I don't know w what it is. I mean, I think, I think there, are, there are historical reasons. We've, we've had peace and stability in Britain for a very long time. Our yeah. last revolution was centuries ago, and really no one was killed. Uh, we, we, we missed the totalitarian disaster the continental Europe experienced, and that the Germans had twice, first with the Gestapo and then with the Stasi. Uh, and plus we have, uh, we have these kind of cultural tropes about spying um, drilled into our brains. We have James Bond jumping out of a helicopter with a Union Jack for the o opening ceremony yeah. for the Olympics. Um, we have spooks um, and so on. And so I think it's been quite hard to get purchased with this story. And, and I think there are two other factors. One is that the Guardian is not popular on, on Fleet Street because of our expose of phone hacking 
Uh, and so none of the other newspapers, who, who actually, to be fair to them, didn't have this material, so it was harder for them to report on it. But, you know, to begin with, they wouldn't follow up. Uh, Which you suggest is also because of the D notice that yeah, was issued. But also there's an issue with D notices. For, for those who don't know, we have a defense advisory system whereby uh, a retired uh, wing commander, whom we nicknamed Wingco, would send a letter around, which of course you never saw, because it was all private, to the BBC, to Sky, to other newspapers saying, we're not telling you what to do, but we would like you to be very aware of issues of national security. So every time we broke a major exclusive, Winko would fire off another email. And, and I have to say, it had a dampening effect on the BBC. The, mm. the BBC is now has, has, is reporting on this stuff and has been doing for some months. But for the first two or three months, they ignored this story. Uh, I think quite shamefully. You, the, uh, we did a major story about <coughs> Britain spying on its G20 allies. Uh, William Haig was on the Today program the following day. They didn't ask him one, can, one question, and they went to a story about otters after that. I mean, it, it was dismaying. Um, uh, and so there's a kind, of, a kind of culture of deference towards the establishment. And I think finally, the reason the political parties didn't respond is because they're both invested in this system. I mean, neither Labour nor the Conservatives told you that all of your data is being secretly hoovered up by the spy agencies. Um, they didn't tell you, they didn't actually tell the National Security Council. Um, and this was signed off by a tiny handful of people, by former Labour Foreign Secretaries. We think David Miliband, but he hasn't said anything about this at all. Uh, and then subsequently <coughs> defended by, by the current coalition administration. And so they're all complicit in the system, actually. Um, and I, I think that the, the, the depressing thing is the failure of oversight um, and the fact that really that, that Downing Street still is adopting an attitude, despite all these reforms going in the United States, of move along, nothing to see here. But you say they're all complicit, but they, both the Democrats and the Republicans were complicit in the US. It does seem to be very, very stark, the difference between the level of debate here and the level in the US. Um, yeah. Uh, what can I say? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, think, I think we need a British constitution. I think we need a First Amendment. I think we need to think seriously about... Uh, about um, formalizing defenses for freedom of speech, formalizing um, defenses for journalists who, who, who are publishing investigative stories in the public interest on, on sensitive matters. Um, and yeah, support us, read us, tweet about it, um, talk about it. Um, there, there's a big play, I've, I've just done a piece for The Guardian coming out on Saturday, there's a big play at the Don Meyer Warehouse opening next week called Privacy. I think the yeah. more we can get this conversation going, the better it is for the democracy, uh, for our democracy, and the, the better it is for freedom of speech in Britain and elsewhere. So there's three things you can do. You can buy the book. Mm. You can join English Pen here, and you can buy the book at Foils. Uh, and you can also sign up to the Don't Spar Us campaign at don'tsparnus.org.uk. It'll be good to give a round of applause to you.